Hello Towers Institute. This is Gail Simon speaking from Yorkshire in the north of England. I'm a systemic therapist and I'd like to start by saying congratulations Towers Institute. 30 year anniversary. That's no small feat. And in a special thank you to the founders of the Towers Institute, in particular Sheila McNamee, Ken Gergen, Mary Gergen, and of course Harleen Anderson, um, all of whom have made a stunning set of contributions across, across a very broad international collection of communities. And you've connected us all through the Towers Institute, through events, through publications, uh, um, through, um, of course, the wonderful community of Taos Associates. Um, so I want to start by just uh, taking you through some of my journey in relation to social construction, which I don't think is that different from that of other people. I trained in uh, systemic therapy in uh, the early 1990s at the Kensington Consultation Centre. And I've called this presentation Social Construction quite a trip because it has been quite a trip. Uh, a bit like this roller coaster image on the screen. It's been trippy, it's tripped me up, and tripped me up in the sense of, like I suppose for many people, going through that invisible gate of a, a um, a paradigm shift it helps you question or forces you to question all of your taken for granted all of the most deeply held take uh, assumptions that guide us that we've been schooled in about how we're going to see the world how we see each other what realities we're creating with each other and the consequences the social fallout of those narrative communicative acts. Um, so that's a, um, a quick pick of me uh, taken a couple of years ago and I just wanted to jump back first of all. Firstly at the moment I'm surrounded by a pile of books on my desk and, and here are some of them that I'm going to show you. When I did sociology at uh, uh, college back in um, oh the late 70s um, I read John Berger, well I don't remember the exact timings actually of when his publication came out and when I was studying, but I remember John Berger's work being hugely influential because he used texts and images to challenge what you thought you were seeing. So if he, he showed you a picture of, um, for example, of Van Gogh painting and said, asked, what is it you think you're seeing here? And you would, in your own mind or aloud, answer in a certain way, a very first order level of description. And then you flip the page and he said, now, what do you make of this bit of information in relation to the picture? And you would see the picture completely differently. And that's an important ethical lesson, not just a practical layer of uh, or filter through which we can make sense of our worlds, but it's important to recognize there are many other bits of information that act as filters for how we think of each other or different communities and how we, we act in terms of what we value. Now, this book here, um, Therapy is Social Construction, was... Uh, hugely influential text for me, uh, edited by Sheila McNamee and Kenneth Gergen. It came out, I think, in 1992, thereabouts. I, I was doing my therapy training at the time and um, uh, was pivotal because it wasn't just about therapy as a body of texts based on a body of texts that were like fixed interpretive uh, ways of seeing others. It was asking therapists to take much more responsibility for how they construed others and whether and 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 an invitation in a sense particularly through Gianfranco Cicchini another systemic social constructionist therapist 
to, to think more irreverently, not disrespectfully, but more irreverently about where ideas come from, what, which language practices, which practices of communication are considered normal and what they generate and why we are as therapists sometimes uh, seduced into certain ways of being and talking and seeing. So this was a very important book and you'll see that there are two copies of it here and that's simply because it, the first copy fell to pieces. And this is a, as you can see in this picture, which actually is showing a, a really wonderful paper which tries to turn around the power relations within the therapeutic relationship. Um, the client is ex the expert and not knowing approach to therapy, which could have easily been entitled therapists. You need to kind of reposition yourselves as people who are constantly learning with and from the clients and hold in parentheses what it is you think you already know. This was very pivotal paper. And of course, Harleen Anderson and Harold Galician wrote this fantastic paper, another, well, maybe the most, for me, the most pivotal paper, 1987, I think, Human Systems as Linguistic Systems. It was the most profound shift away from thinking of families, teams, organizations as having the problem, as needing their behaviors correcting, as needing fixing by therapists, by consultants. And instead, there was a reframe to rather look at the language in play that came out of different cultures, different eras, different lessons learned on their way through life. And it made for a huge, more respectful way of addressing each other, the subject and so on. So that was really important. And the place I came across uh, these um, uh, papers wasn't, a, as in the picture here, a pizza and chicken shop. It was in one of the buildings on this street on the South Lambeth Road um, in Vauxhall, London. Um, the Kensington Consultation Centre was a, the place that brought um, social construction into systemic therapy, into family therapy, into couple therapy in the UK in the 80s when it set up under the uh, under the leaders uh, Dr Peter Lang and Martin Little and later they brought and many many other people they had teaching alongside them Susan Lang, Christine Oliver, Dessa Markovic, Fran Hedges, Sharon Bond, apologies for those I'm missing out here, uh, Glenda Fredman, Karen Partridge, many others. Um, um, uh, that, so that was a very important uh, thing. Now, not only did, um, well, I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, another paper that was really important for me as a lesbian therapist who was struggling to find texts that were not out of the normative developmental, heteronormative developmental stable where most of the theories about what a human was, what a human looked like, well, they were just pictures of some 1950s two plus two type of family. And the stories, worse, about people with alternative gender identities and sexual orientations, was that something had gone wrong. You know what? At the time I was training, as a therapist and looking for trainings as a therapist in the 80s and 90s. Lesbian and gay therapists were not even allowed to train as therapists in psychoanalytic institutes. Really, that's the case. They were not considered sufficiently mature. So trying to deconstruct heterosexuality as a social construction was very, very important. It wasn't and didn't need to be a given or the norm or the gold standard. And Celia Kitzinger, a, um, a, a British social constructionist, social psychologist, academic, 
wrote this incredible book. I'll just bring that up on the screen too. The Social Construction of Lesbianism. What a title. Can you imagine what a relief that was for me and my colleagues uh, to find, and uh, my queer colleagues to find in the 19, I think this came out early 1990, something like that. But she wrote a book in, a, a, a chapter in a book called Liberal Humanism as an Ideology of Social Control, the Regulation of Lesbian Identities. This was a very important text. It helped make so much sense of the kind of discourse are going on around, not just in society, but particularly in the world of the psychotherapies, counselling, social work. So uh, uh, these were wonderful texts. So renormatizing, re I don't know if that's a word, but anyway, um, it, it was very helpful to, to feel uh, one's siblings, academic siblings around offering support through theorizing and that helped because in the pink practice that I co-founded with Gwyn Whitfield, in fact these are Gwyn's scribbles and things on, on the page here, it's not my writing. Um, Gwyn and I co-founded the pink practice which was a systemic social constructionist, is a systemic social constructionist therapy practice based in London. Um, in 1990, so you can see the timing of all this was really important because we needed to get theorists, practitioners around us that weren't going to reproduce uh, same old pathologizing theories that would, in a sense, have recolonized us as queer practitioners. We needed to do something different. We needed to find new ways of doing therapy that did not import um, colonizing, pathologizing ideas and impose them um, into uh, the queer community. And of course, us being members of that queer community, uh, we needed to look out for ourselves and the people with whom we were working. Now, not only did um, uh, the Kensington Consultation Centre, KCC, uh, put on trainings for therapists and for organisational consultants, it also ran a journal in conjunction with the Leeds Family Therapy and Research Centre. And for that, we have to credit Peter Stratton and Helga Hanks, who held this journal together for decades and made it happen. And you can see from the list here, Maturana, Leppington, Schotter, Michael Preston, Schutten, and Dick Agassen, and a perspective from Peter Stratton. This journal um, and uh, copies of it are freely available if you look hard enough on the internet. Um, wonderful papers by, m I, I think, all of the Towers founders and many uh, of the other Towers members um, from uh, who were around in the 80s and 90s um, and 2000s for sure had papers published here because they knew this was a good journal in which to be published. It was for systemic social constructionist readers, practitioners. But the reason I brought up this particular vo uh, issue, volume two, issue two, is because of the third paper down. From constructivism to social constructionism and doing critical therapy by Roseanne Leppington was for me my most go-to paper. I've lived with it. In fact, you can see this is quite, I'm afraid, a sticky torn copy of the journal. But this paper was brilliant because, and it's so important to try and understand that theory within psychotherapies had never previously been situated within different ideologies. It had never critiqued where, what, what influences were in play, what cultural influences, which colonizing assumptions were in play that influenced not only what we did with people and how we thought about what we did, but power relations within the therapeutic relationship. So what Roseanne Leppington did and 
Um, I wrote about this more, by the way, in a paper called Praction Research. Praction Research, you'll find uh, it in my academia.edu uh, collection of papers. There's a link at the end of this. Um, but what Roseanne Leppington did was she created a, a, a kind of uh, diagram based on the coordinated management of meaning um, practice by Vernon Cronin and Barnett Pierce, with whom she studied at Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology around this time. But what she was saying is, look, we might talk about method and we might talk about um, what we produce. So she, but she also said method comes from somewhere. And it, when it, it's not just that we have some naive, innocent preference. Oh, I like working with couples. Oh, I like psychoanalytic. Oh, I like person-centered. Oh, I like systemic. It's not as accidental as that. She says, what happens before the level of what we do are theoretical propositions. And theoretical propositions are not innocent. They come out of an ideology, a set of cultural beliefs. They come out of assumptions. She calls them methodological assumptions, that this is a, an invisible layer that we all have to explore and be honest about and look into to think, what's at work for me that I'm more attracted to this than that? Because theory doesn't just fall out of the sky. It isn't just an accidental a creation. It's uh, a set of ideas that some people made up at a certain moment in time, in certain cultural contexts, with power relations going on in the background about whose ideas count, which ideas count, which practices are sanctioned, which people are not sanctioned and so on. So this was very helpful for me because I think going back to this again, as a lesbian therapist, as a woman who uh, has always identified as a feminist and didn't fit into mainstream uh, professional identities and represented a community before I represented a profession, the professional practices needed to uh, address power relations and I needed to understand where I was coming from and be able to challenge other therapists, particularly as a trainer or sometimes supervisor or just another colleague about where their ideologies were in play that created blank spots for them about what they could and couldn't see in what they brought to their practice. And this is a quote from Roseanne Lippington. The question then is not, how does the individual rational consciousness account for the social world, but how in a social world to account for the culturally specific notions of the individual. She was pointing to the fact that even systemic thinkers, even social constructionist thinkers were still singling out the liberal humanist unit of the individual, dovetailing with uh, echoing some of what Celia Kitzinger was writing about, um, that by focusing within psychotherapy on the individual and ignoring the wider system, we're reinforcing liberal humanist ideas which are really about social control. It's much easier to control individuals through internal policing, through external policing and more than to think about how did we ever develop so much foregrounding of the individual? And of course, these are very culturally specific notions. They come from white Western uh, Christian societies about the responsibilities of the individual, not about communities, which you find the com community being foregrounded, one finds and comes across in many other places. And this influenced a paper I wrote. It was my first proper publication. It came out of my 
dissertation at the KCC. Um, incitement to riot? Question mark. Individual identity and group membership? Some reflections on the politics of a postmodern therapy. I worried then and I still worry now that liberal humanism is still impacting on social constructionist thinking. And so in a way, I'd invite you all to, to read this and see whether you find this, that there's any connection for you still uh, uh, um, with liberal humanist underpinnings because they do uh, reinforce power relations and social construction has the power, the potential actually, as well as the power to undo a lot of those power relations. But we have to acknowledge the impact of liberal humanist ideas or neoliberal ideas as well now, not the same thing. But there were many other people I just wanted to quickly mention. I mentioned earlier, Christine Oliver, who was called the queen of CMM. Now, she developed the ideas of uh, coordinated management of meaning and Barnett Pierce and Vernon Cronin, who developed those ideas, worked very closely with Sheila McNamee and other um, Taos founders. And um, um, in fact, they, they uh, wrote a special issue. Um, they edited a special issue on um, of human systems, the Journal of Systemic Consultation and Management um, on social construction. And Fran Hedges did a really important intervention uh, in the therapeutic world by uh, bringing systemic social constructionist ideas to work with individuals, because that was happening at the Kensington Consultation Centre. It was one of its uh, um, revolutionary contributions. In fact, um, Gwyn Whitfield at the Pink Practice also um, trained in systemic social constructionist practice with individuals. So it wasn't just the domain of family therapy or couple therapy or working with organizations. Um, and I wanted to jump onto one of the other people that I haven't mentioned yet in relation to social construction. And that is John Schotter. And there you'll see a lovely picture of uh, me and Sheila and John at John Schotter's Festschrift in Luton in probably about October 2016, I think. And it was a wonderful event. It was called Performing John Schotter. Um, Sheila read something, Jack Lanneman read something, Harleen made a beautiful video. I, and uh, in fact, Jack, sorry, Jack actually spoke to John on the, on the phone in front of us all. It was just a beautiful thing to hear. Uh, Harleen made a beautiful video about how she read John's papers and books time and time again on the plane. And uh, uh, and Mary and Ken Gergen also uh, made a beautiful recording, which were, all of these were shared on the day and many other people contributed. But um, the Taos Institute was one of John's homes. They published many of his works, um, in particular texts of identity, which for me was another, I'm surprised that book isn't falling to pieces, another a um, really important go-to book. Um, uh, and as you can see here, um, uh, there are, uh, well, I want to in particular mention um, chapter six and chapter nine, but chapter six, I already mentioned Celia Kitzinger's regulation of lesbian identities. But this, this has been social accountability and the social construction of you has been for me, the most helpful text in understanding what it is we're doing with each other in therapy. It's one of those texts that's made up of a series of absolutely stunning quotes. And um, I just want to sort of point out actually that that, was, uh, uh, that book was um, uh, edited by John and uh, John Schotter and Ken Gergen. Um, um, this is one quote from that beautiful chapter. It's not so much how I can use language in itself that matters as the way in which I must take you into account in my use of it. It's not so much how I can use language in itself that matters as the way in which I must take you into account in my use of it. 
and another quote by John Schotter. I act not simply out of my own plans and desires, unrestricted by the social circumstances of my performances, but in some sense also into the opportunities offered to me to act, or else my attempts to communicate will fail or be sanctioned in some way. And this second quote, it's a reminder that what we ask brings forth different responses. So for example, somebody who asks, oh, are you depressed in the context of therapy? It's likely to create a depressed person. But asking, so what kind of words come to mind that would describe how you're feeling at the moment? might bring forth a very different set of responses to what you think you've noticed. And that then creates or creates a space for new descriptions of a person to emerge. So how we set up conversations brings forth different stories about each other and ourselves. In fact, this paper, Social Accountability and the Social Construction of You, um, was published in Murmurations Journal, republished in Murmurations Journal of Transformative Systemic Practice um, as a revival paper. What This is something we do in the journal. I'm connected to the journal. I'm one of the founding members. Uh, sorry, not one of the founding editors. Um, and now a member, a founding member, that's all. Um, but you'll see if you just look at the bottom line on this under the abstract here. So we publish John's paper, then we invite reflections from some key colleagues. Justine van Lauwek in the Netherlands, Jim Wilson in Wales, Sheila McNamee, Mary Gergen in the States, John Burnham in Birmingham, England, um, Ken Gergen, Andy Locke in Australia, and Anne Cunliffe in the States, Brazil, I'm not sure where Anne is at the moment, or the UK. But the point is that they wrote some reflections on this paper, and it's a very interesting thing to do to revisit papers that have been so profound. Um, and uh, um, it, if, if John had still been alive, which sadly he wasn't at the time in 2019, we would have asked him for a reflection on, on that paper as well. I wonder what he would have said. He was always revisiting his ideas. So um, I just wanted to mention murmurations to you. Actually, John Schotter gave us the idea for the title of this journal. He was very interested in dynamic stabilities, which is a very interesting way of thinking about systemic social constructionist therapy or practice as a movement of spontaneous relational coordinations between people that somehow we communicate, somehow we move forward, sometimes with and without others. There are power relations in play. It's not always quite as well coordinated as it seems. Some people go missing, and that sounds too innocent in some ways, but also parts of our planet also go missing. And John was very interested in dynamic stabilities. So the, and in particular, murmurations of birds. So um, we uh, called the, the journal Murmurations, Journal of Transformative Systemic Practice. Liz Day did the drawing. She's one of the founding editors. Birgitta Pedersen, organizational consultant, one of the founding editors, now hosted by three different editors, Leah Salter, Marilena Karamatsuki, and Joanna Mishapulu. And please visit it at murmurations.cloud and please write for it. You know, one of the things that Ken Gergen did um, is uh, that's probably in his book Relational Being, but he wrote about the relationship, the social construction of the relationship between readers and writers. And he, the, the reason we set up murmurations is because we needed a publication that would allow practitioners to speak from within the living moment of practice, not from an aboutness position, not from some anaesthetized, dissociated position of apparently professionals and what apparently professional speak should be like, but to speak as and with a range of voices and experiences 
so that we can hear not only the outer dialogue or behaviours, but we can see, hear, feel the inner dialogue, the tensions, the embodied movements. So the papers within this journal would not find their way into other uh, mainstream publications by systemic social constructionist uh, writers, except perhaps for Harleen's journal, Harleen Anderson and Co's journal, the International Journal of Collaborative Dialogic Practice. Please look that up as well. The International Journal of Collaborative Dialogic Practice. It's been a real gift to the social constructionist and systemic communities. Again, freely available like murmurations, completely open access, and this is part of the ethic, I think, within the Taoist community and beyond to make sure that texts, writings are open access. You can visit this journal at murmurations.cloud. Um, and um, uh, what, just going back to Ken's point about reading and writing as relationship, um, that was very important for me when I was doing my um, thesis, my doctoral thesis, which uh, uh, maybe I'll just make mention that Sheila McNamee, uh, along with Glenda Fredman, was uh, were my examiners, um, and uh, my my doctoral research was on systemic practice, no writing as systemic practice, writing in brackets as end of brackets systemic practice because it's a relational practice and it involves a lot of relational ethics and creative possibilities because there's so much movement, so much movement that goes on in the world between us, whether in organizations, in shoals of fish, clouds of birds, uh, therapeutic relationships, communities that are remote, such as the Taos Associates community, and so on. Um, thank you uh, uh, for listening. Um, Taos Associate, Congratulations again. May the next 30 years be as exciting and growthful and politicized in terms of trying to make the world a better place as the last 30. And um, yeah, congratulations. <laughs>